Sambhat. Our aim was to not only give students the space to discuss and deliberate on topics of great impact, but also to pro provide opportunities to attend talks of eminent personalities in the field of foreign policy and IR. We are honored to host today Ambassador Sujan Archinoy, Director General, Manohar Parker Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis. Ambassador Shojan Arshanoi is a notable Indian diplomat, scholar and strategic affairs expert who has made eminent contributions to the Indian foreign policy and national security discourse. With a career spanning over four decades, he has served in various key positions including as the Ambassador of India to Japan and is currently the Director General of MPIDSA, a leading think tank on defense and security issues in India. Moreover, he is recognized as the foremost expert on China and East Asia with a proficient understanding of the region's economic, political, social, and security dynamics. His major literary works are also based on China. We would now like to invite Ambassador Shanoi to the podium to deliver the keynote lecture. Good morning. Professor uh, Sriram Cholia, Professors uh, Bhatak, Jha, and Ken, uh, Team <coughs> Diplomania. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here today with you all at the OP Jindal University for the very first time. And I was a little concerned that I might not make it on time, not because of the uh, farmer's agitation, that is expected to take place, but uh, uh, more fundamentally because I returned only late last night from Perth. And I was uh, wondering if I should prepare for this lecture, and that was a very daunting and intimidating uh, thought. I thought of uh, making a few slides, and then I thought I might uh, pen down um, an essay which I could read out, and then I gave it all up in favor of uh, sharing a few thoughts with you extempore. And as Winston Churchill had once said, that he was going to make uh, a long speech simply because he had no time to prepare a shorter one. <laughs> and I'm likely to do that over the next uh, 40 minutes or so to walk you through what I regard as uh, globalization or potential deglobalization or the need for reglobalization. And I think the essence of today's lecture is intended to be reglobalization re navigating the way forward. But before we analyze globalization, we must take uh, a hard look at the world as it presents uh, before us today. The world as it presents itself before us today is a world in a fair degree of disarray. It is a world in flux. It is a world that is increasingly exhibiting signs of uncertainty. It is a world in which uh, no single power has the ability to make its writ felt on all issues at all times in all geographies, at least no longer. It is a world in which uh, the process of globalization has not benefited everyone equally. If we were to look at uh, economic globalization, there are many that have fallen through the cracks. There are some that have gamed the system. It is also a world in which uh, we have increasingly seen that the main vectors of growth and progress are actually under stress. Trade and technology are being increasingly weaponized. They being foundational elements in the process of globalization. We also see that uh, finance, which is again fundamental to globalization, is not available as it should be. And even more fundamental is the fact that human resources, in this regard of uh, migration and mobility requirements, are also being prevented from moving around the global economy. It is uh, a fairly difficult and dismal picture in terms of uh, the emerging challenges today. We have seen how the COVID pandemic 
the trade war between the United States of America and the People's Republic of China, that is the reigning hegemon and the rising hegemon, have actually compounded matters. We have seen how the war in Ukraine has fundamentally questioned the security of Europe, which had been taken for granted over the last 75 to 80 years. We have seen how the world has been further rocked by the war in West Asia. And then there have been smaller wars between Armenia and Azerbaijan as well. We have also seen the changes taking place, not always for the better, in Afghanistan. And against this is this huge backdrop of the emerging threats and challenges and opportunities in the Indo-Pacific. In that broad amphitheater which presents itself before our eyes, I would like to refer to seven T's. These are fundamental to the analysis of globalization, deglobalization, if ever that could be achieved, as was rightly pointed out a moment ago by Professor Patak as well, and reglobalization or the resetting of globalization in a manner that would be beneficial to entire to the entire world. The first T is the T of trade. Trade today is under duress. We have seen how it's been increasingly weaponized. There are tendencies leaning towards uh, protectionism, <coughs> towards uh, regionalism, towards uh, minilateralisms, plur plurilateralisms, regional FTAs, and above all, essentially closing the doors when it's not convenient to allow others to enter your market using non-trade barriers, technical barriers to trade to prevent that fundamental globalization from taking place. That's why I said that some have gamed the system. But trade is fungible. It's very difficult to control. It is not something that is conducted out of South Block or, or Pentagon or the State Department. It is uh, often led by structural differences between economies, and it is essentially conducted by entrepreneurs and industrialists and businessmen and businesswomen. And therefore, trade is very difficult to control. We have seen that before our very eyes. Even at the height of uh, major power contestation and attempts to de-risk economies from overwhelming interdependence, or I should say overwhelming dependence on certain geographies, particularly in East Asia, particularly in China, we have seen that it's been very difficult, a task. And we've seen compelling logic which suggests that trade between India and China, between China and the United States, China and Japan has in fact grown in recent years. Technology is the other second T, where in fact uh, it's possible for States, large MNCs, big tech, to step in and inflict a certain amount of pain through sanctions, embargoes, restrictions, etc. Because uh, they are the ones that have led uh, the innovation in the latest technologies and these are not as fungible as mere trade. And we've seen that happening as the United States of America increasingly puts in place regimes aimed at eroding some of the fundamentals of the ecosystem which enabled China to rise over the last half a century. The third T is that of territorial differences, which again challenges globalization as we know it today. And which is why it's very important to remember what the Prime Minister of India has repeatedly said that now is not the time of war and that disputes must be resolved through peaceful negotiations. Territorial disputes today are challenging globalization in every geography. All these T's, the seven T's that I shall elaborate, challenge the process of globalization in every part of the world. And we have seen how territorial disputes 
whether in the East China Sea, the South China Sea, across the high Himalayas between us and China, or for that matter in West Asia, continue to haunt this process of globalization. The fourth T is that of terrorism, which is something that is in fact uh, a threat to all of us, all societies in every part of the world. And yet, instead of building convergence on this common threat, terrorism, the world is increasingly divided on the issue of terrorism. And the reason is that there are strategic partnerships not always working for the common good that emerge due to reasons of expediency. In our part of the world, we have seen one such relationship between the People's Republic of China and Pakistan, and increasingly a permanent member such as the People's Republic of China puts technical holds even in the listing of Jashya Mohammed and Lashkar-e Toiba terrorists at the United Nations under, under the 1267 Al-Qaeda and Sanctions Committee. So here you have an example of the inability of large countries like India and China that face the common threat of terrorism to be able to work together. In fact, the broad multilateral space between contesting powers or major powers that have issues between them such as India and China is also reducing. The multilateral space ought to be a canvas on which we can actually build consensus even when we cannot resolve bilateral issues, but that's not the case today. And the world has not been able to reach any consensus on an international convention on terrorism because of the various interpretations being given to terrorists, good terrorists, bad terrorists, terrorists that are seen as freedom fighters and things of the sort. The fifth T is that of tenets or narratives. And by this I do not mean simply the great and emerging debate and discourse between authoritarian countries, single party, unitary systems of governance, be it political, economic, social or cultural, as is the case between the liberal democratic order, broadly speaking, and the authoritarian countries, examples of which are well known to you. But there is also an issue of friction on tenets, as in narratives, between the countries that led globalization, led industrialization, and those that were earlier colonies and part of the developing world, now more commonly known as the Global South. So the divide is not merely between the East and the West or the authoritarians versus the democratic uh, countries, but also between erstwhile colonial powers that seem to think that they are always meant for all times to come through an exceptionalism that they have awarded themselves in the current UN system to set the agenda for the global south again for all times to come. The sixth T is that of transparency. The world today is yearning for transparency. There is a fundamental shift in the balance of power that's taking place. There is friction between countries on account of several of these T's that I mentioned to you. A lot of expenditure is taking place on building militaries, on new weapon systems, on net-centric warfare beyond visual range, missiles and things of the sort. And yet, it is impossible to gauge or get to the bottom of what you call motivation, intentions. It is easy to do bean counting with regard to an adversary's assets in terms of the number of aircraft carriers or ships or battle tanks or missile systems, but it is virtually impossible to get into the mind and read intentions and motivations. And therefore, it is a very challenging task 
to build any kind of transparency today in the global structure. Misreading intentions lead to miscalculations and unexpected occurrences that further challenge globalization as we know it. This has taken place in Ukraine, it has taken place in West Asia, and we could, cannot rule out the possibilities of this taking place elsewhere. We have experienced it firsthand in Galwan as well. The seventh T is actually foundational, again, to all of these, and that is the T of trust. Trust today in globalization is missing, and it leads to deep animosities, a feeling of uh, a permanence in adversarial relations, uh, and this, uh, again, is leading to the building of uh, coalitions in a fractured world. I want to hearken you back to history because it's, it's virtually impossible to look for solutions in globalization or the challenges in globalization without looking at how we in India have experienced globalization through the ages. If I were to look back, India's past is also mired in these key principles of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, considering the entire community, the global community as one family. And I think when I look back at India's ancient past, I see that we were in fact champions of a different kind of globalization. For India, it was a globalization that was predicated on ideas, on philosophy, on preaching uh, brotherhood and sisterhood. It comes so naturally to us. And we saw it through an expression, the impulse of Buddhism that was, you know, that sprouted in India and then was spread to different parts of uh, Asia. And this comes at a time when, in fact, uh, uh, many countries uh, in uh, the West, or uh, the empires of that time, whether it was the Greek Empire or the Persian empires, they were looking for warfare and conquest of territory. And India even then was looking for conquest of hearts and minds through our great classical scholars that went abroad. We had uh, people like uh, um, Dharmaratna and Matanga who went to China. We had Bodhidharma who went from Mamallapuram also to preach ideas, to preach philosophies, to preach Vasudeva Kutumbakam. And so we were then different from others who sought conquest in terms of territory, whether it was the the Huns or whether it was the uh, Scythians, uh, they were all warlike people that came with the sword. We, in fact, made these people that came into India part of our, uh, what we call, syncretic fabric and uh, assimilated them with love, with the power of our ideas, our philosophy, our thought, and Vasudeva Kutumbakam. When I look at the uh, millennium thereafter, I can see that there were various impulses at globalization. The uh, globalization that was actually pursued by the uh, Pallavas, for example, uh, and the Cholas had uh, a maritime dimension to it. Once again, transport of ideas and philosophy along with trade and commerce and culture such that large parts of Asia, such as Southeast Asia, took on an Indic civilizational layer that we see expressed today even in the Ramayana and the Mahabharat that we see among the Islamic countries of Southeast Asia, whether it is Indonesia or Malaysia. And such was that power of India in forging uh, a very different kind of globalization. When we look at the age of discovery and the age of exploration, it is, to my mind, again, very different between how we saw it and how uh, many of the uh, you know, countries, emerging powers of the industrial world saw it. They were looking for territories. They were looking for hinterlands. They were looking for raw materials to power their industrial revolution and their rise over 150 years. And India at that time was also, once again, through the power of ideas, putting out a different kind of globalization. But the colonization of a large country like India actually removed our strategic autonomy. 
There was a period of a few centuries when we stopped participating in the process of globalization, whatever it was in that period. It was left to others to interpret our globalization. From this continent, subcontinent of ours, it was left to others to interpret that. Which is why I say that it was not India that actually, uh, you know, of its own volition, went about being the sword arm of the British Empire. We had no choice. And these are things that have mattered to the process of globalization in subsequent decades and uh, centuries as well. I think it was in the 19th century that globalization took on a very different and exploitative uh, color with the uh, developed countries of today. Then the colonial powers such as Britain, such as uh, France, uh, Holland, uh, Portugal, Spain having arrogated to themselves and allocated to themselves certain geographies as being their hinterlands for colonization. It led to a huge debate on whether the seas should be open or closed. Once again, we are seeing in the process of globalization these notions of freedom of navigation and overflight and unimpeded commerce on the high seas, things that we ascribe to today in terms of calling for a rules-based international order. These are being challenged today, but they were also challenged in the past. 1603, you remember that the Dutch uh, uh, legal luminary, uh, Hugo Grotius, was asked to write a legal brief to justify why the Dutch had seized a Portuguese vessel called the Santa Catarina in uh, Southeast Asia, across the Malacca. And the Dutch had seized it out of protest because the Portuguese were there uh, at that point of time uh, propagating the notion of closed seas, what they called mare clausum, as against a mare libre. And because the Portuguese were such a powerful entity in that age of colonization and age of discovery, that they had said that these geographies belong only to us. Doesn't that remind you of what the Chinese are saying today? The neo-colonialism that we are witnessing, which is, which is taking place in certain parts of the world, notably in the South China Sea, attempts to make it a mare clausum as against a mare libre. So these are not new challenges. But I would say it's the 20th century that actually, about 100 years ago, lie many lessons for analyzing the globalization of today. This kind of contestation between the colonial powers in the 18th and the 19th centuries, when they were competing against each other for dividing the world and the resources among themselves, it led to the First World War. At the end of the First World War, after millions had been killed, there was this very feeble attempt made to create uh, peace to create permanent structures for peace and progress through the Treaty of Versailles, which turned out to be a damp squib. It was virtually dead on arrival. And so was the League of Nations that came about a year later in 1920. Again, an attempt to create a permanent structure to ensure that globalization is beneficial to humankind. That war should never take place. That a, a, a structure be put in place to ensure the permanence of peace and prosperity and progress for all. But if the largest economy in the world, not yet the largest military power, the largest economy in the world then, that is to say the United States of America, was not committed to the League of Nations, there stood no chance. And countries like Germany and Japan, which had fought on different sides during the First World War, increasingly found that their own aspirations were being thwarted by the League of Nations, it led to their militarization and ultimately to the catastrophic Second World War. The Second World War was also a lesson in globalization and uh, it resulted in fact in victory for a few. The five uh, permanent members of the UN Security Council were chosen simply on the basis of the principle that to the victor belong all the spoils. And one Asian country uh, the Republic of China, mind you, not yet the People's Republic of China, was inducted into this exceptional and privileged structure simply to add a little color 
to what was otherwise a very European looking permanent membership of the UN Security Council. And we saw how at that point of time, capitalism and communism could also work together, albeit for a brief period, at least until 1947, till that partnership unraveled between the United States of America and the Soviet Union, they worked together to fight Nazism. And when the Cold War began, globalization was of a very different type. There was the East Bloc, there was the Western Bloc, and they did not have mutual economic interdependence between them. The world had been divided into two camps, and you either belonged to one camp or the other. And many wanted to be part of the non-aligned world. Non-alignment itself did not mean that you did not align with anybody. India, uh, in fact, is an example that despite our being a non-aligned country, a champion of non-alignment, beginning 1961, we, in fact, in 1962, sought military assistance from no less than the United States of America. And of course, the war ended before much of that assistance could come in into India. The 62 aggression by China, the border conflict, the border war. In 1971, once again, we proved the fact that non-alignment does not mean that you cannot align. That there is issue-based alignment that's possible. Even then, as we speak of issue-based <coughs> alignment or multi-alignment multi now, there are examples in history in the 20th century, including our own. When we, in 1971, signed a treaty of peace, friendship, and cooperation with the Soviet Union. What was that, if not alignment? Issue-based alignment in order to deal with a particular threat in 1971. But today's world, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends, young students, uh, India's future, the world is very different. Today, we are looking at an international situation in which the entire global community, as a result of the process of globalization, which was sparked off by the establishment of GATT in 1947, and of course the more sophisticated, uh, uh, you know, curated, uh, designed version uh, known as the WTO beginning 1995, as a result of this, everybody is dependent on one another. Uh, in fact, uh, this mutual interdependence is of the type that didn't exist during the Cold War. So it, at a time when the world is once again dividing along what you call, uh, you know, ideational uh, lines. Uh, it's very difficult for the rest of us to choose between one or the other of the major uh, powers, uh, the reigning hegemon and the rising hegemon, because we are all interconnected. Let me briefly also tell you what I think of strategic autonomy. You see, strategic autonomy today is practiced by virtually every country in the world. It is uh, a desirable and aspirational quality even for the most powerful of nations. Even the United States of America wants strategic autonomy in terms of its overweening dependence on China. It, it wants that autonomy which it is seeking through the Inflation Reduction Act or the Science and, 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 and Technology Act or the CHIPS Act, etc or the French shoring, reshoring, onshoring. It is a, an expression of strategic autonomy, a desire to have more of it. And uh, we can also see that strategic autonomy is not always available. It's not a luxury that's available to every country uh, in every field. You may have strategic autonomy at the uh, economic level. You may not have strategic autonomy and agency at the political level. In many ways, I would say Japan traditionally has been a good example of having a great deal of strategic autonomy at the economic level, but I would say not much in terms of its uh, political or security outlook. That's not uh, uh, as fully expressed uh, in Japan's uh, orientation when it comes to security, when it comes to international political relations. Uh, some of that has to hew close to how uh, its uh, allies and treaty partners such as the United States look at issues. It is also important to note that uh, when we speak of multipolarity, it's such a commonly used term today, the world is drifting towards multipolarity. There is obviously more of it because all states 
have more of strategic autonomy today, are, are able to express themselves in terms of issue-based alignment or multi-alignment much more than they, they could do in the past to play off various partners. But it is important to remember that everybody is not equally important in this emerging drift towards multipolarity. Multipolarity, particularly when it comes to middle powers, is also a spectrum in which you have larger uh, nodes of multipolarity like India and perhaps lesser ones also. So I would not say that multipolarity is a one-size-fits-all when it comes to judging, for example, uh, the nature, the role, the future space that countries like Mexico, or Turkey or Indonesia uh, or Australia or India will occupy. And obviously India stands out in that spectrum as one that is going to have much greater agency in years to come. Um, I would also like to say that this is uh, in fact uh, an era in the 21st century when India is finally coming into its own. It is uh, today now the world's fastest growing large economy uh, and a lot of this impulse has come after a period of doubt, of self-introspection, of uh, uh, despondency temporarily, mercifully uh, created by uh, the COVID pandemic. And in fact, after the COVID pandemic, India has actually found its rhythm, not just as uh, a country uh, that lives up to the principle of Vasudeva Kutumbakam that uh, uh, aspires to be uh, uh, what you call a Vishwa uh, Mitra uh, through Vishwa Mitrata. Um, I would rather use the term Vishwa Mitra and Mitrata than use the word Vishwa Guru, uh, for India does not purport to be the leader, in my view, of the Global South. India obviously is committed to being the voice of the Global South on an equal basis, um, working pro bono for the larger good as we did during the COVID pandemic, as we have done subsequently uh, through uh, becoming what we call uh, a net security provider by ensuring that we have uh, a very good uh, neighborhood first policy or that we are able to participate uh, you know, much better in the uh, global discourses um, that uh, are around us uh, from the East Asia summit process uh, or the quadrilateral security dialogue to being an active partner uh, of the ASEAN regional forum uh, to working closely uh, with neighbors in terms of our Sagar uh, policy or the blue economy uh, of ensuring that uh, Indian initiatives like the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium uh, or the more foundational Indian Ocean Rim Association, that these work uh, in a manner that's fit to purpose for the 21st century. We are also looking further afar at issues uh, uh, that will determine the uh, future of our geography in the 21st century by having a different quad in West Asia, the uh, I2, U2, uh, or more recently uh, working closely uh, with uh, uh, other countries like the United States uh, and many others to see if we can create the international, uh, uh, what we call uh, um, Middle East, uh, in, you know, the, the, the India, Middle East, Europe uh, economic corridor. Um, so these are things that India is doing at a time when it has emerged as the fifth largest economy, well on to its way to becoming the third largest economy in the world. But the world that India will inherit in the future uh, as one of the major powers is not necessarily going to be a very satisfactory one. And the primary reason is that Global orders, particularly the global order that has been put in place since the end of the Second World War, is uh, an order where, as I said before, a certain clutch of countries have arrogated to themselves exceptional powers. And these are systems and frameworks created uh, at a moment of time that reflected their ascendancy. but do not necessarily reflect the current uh, situation where balance of power has shifted in favor of the developing countries, where countries like uh, India are actually contributing much more to new 
global economic growth than many of the erstwhile traditional uh, centers of economic growth and prosperity. And yet it is a world in which India will have to learn to coexist with unfairness, inbuilt, frozen frameworks uh, which are motivated, uh, such as, for example, the United Nations, its uh, Security Council, which shows no signs of reform. Take a look at the UN Security Council. As I mentioned a while ago, it was created in 1945. <coughs> and there was no change at all till a debate took place in the ECOSOC in 1961 about the need for reforms. It lasted for four years. It was only in 1965 that for the first time since 1945, the UN Security Council was reformed and the non-permanent category, you, you would have guessed right, it was the non-permanent category, increased from 6 to 10, taking the total number from 11 to 15. And thereafter, there has been absolutely no change. Since 1965, and we are now in, you know, so 59 years later, we are looking at the same structure in which the permanent five, in fact, are no longer what they were in 1945. In fact, China was not even in the UN Security Council in 1945. It helicoptered into the Security Council in 1971, when because of the unfolding geopolitics of the time and the need for the United States of America to find a strategic uh, sort of uh, partner to deal with an ascendant Soviet Union, it forged a strategic partnership of convenience with the People's Republic and the West actually brought in um, with their own support the People's Republic of China into the Security Council uh, and removed the Republic of China from the Security Council. And many powers within this existing unequal P5 structure are actually diminished powers. There are at least uh, uh, clearly uh, you can see two of them that India has uh, long overtaken, one more recently and one many years ago in terms of our economic heft. The Russian economy, uh, they are our good friends, but their economy is less than one half uh, that of India. And uh, we have clearly overtaken uh, the United Kingdom also in terms of our economic heft and power. And we are doing much more on many other fronts, whether it is the uh, COVID vaccine and pandemic, whether it is uh, using our expeditionary uh, resources to benefit the region at times of need, and yet we are not part of the UN uh, Security Council. Will this change anytime soon? I would say no, because global orders are neither created nor dismantled easily. In my view, it takes cataclysmic events such as wars, such as the First World War, such as the Second World War, perhaps even such as the use of nuclear weapons, as was the, uh, you know, uh, abhorrent case in the, in, 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 in the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki by the Americans in 1945. That brings about fundamental change. It does not happen out of the milk of human kindness. It does not happen because of the power of debate and conviction, as uh, we would do in you know, uh, diplomania, that let's have change, let there be change. It's not quite so simple. People and countries behave similarly. Countries do not give up power quite so easily. So how will this structure change? Uh, do we really want to therefore challenge the, the basic structure as it exists? Is India one of those outliers that challenges the existing structure? I would say that India is a country that's calling for genuine reforms. And I did add the rider that such change cannot come about easily. It is not for the asking. Global orders cannot be made or dismantled easily. And yet we must continue to seek that reset in globalization. We must continue to call for the equality of you know, all countries. The need to have 1.4 billion people and a country like India represented at the high table working for the global good, not looking for territorial conquest, not looking to exploit the global south, as do many others. Um, and, and that is the kind of tone that we have to set for that. Are all the others also doing the same? I would say no. China, for example, the rise of China is a great 
and disruptive element in this uh, what you call challenges of globalization and the need for re-globalization. But China itself is riding two horses. China is loath to do away with or dispense with the existing global structure for it is the existing global structure that has given rise to the People's Republic of China. Since 1971, as a member of the UN Security Council and uh, a decade later as an integral uh, you know, partner for the United States and the West even on economic issues. Its entry into the WTO in 2001, even if the WTO may be seen as defunct now, unable to function uh, similarly uh, as is the case with the UN Security Council, even so, it is the existing global structure that has occasioned the rise of China. And why would China want to destroy the world? But China, you know, is uh, uh, definitely, it, uh, you know, contests the fact that the agenda in the existing world order is set primarily by the West, notably by the United States of America, and that is what it seeks to tweak. But China is not uh, uh, satisfied with simply being part of the existing global structure and reaping the benefits that it has. It is also creating parallel structures at, aimed at reinterpreting globalization fundamentally, such as the creation of the Asian Infrastructure and Investment <coughs> Bank, or for example, creating and pushing the new uh, development bank of the BRICS. These are multilateral structures with which India is also associated because of our own belief that we do need to have better financial, uh, you know, uh, flows available for infrastructure development, uh, particularly in Asia. But China is also using its unique uh, national capacities uh, and banks uh, and the deep financial assets that it has uh, at its disposal through uh, programs such as the Belt and Road Initiative. And so China is riding two horses. So we are uh, looking at uh, restructuring or resetting globalization in a very different way. And let me end with a thought here that where the UN Security Council has failed us all, where we cannot simply wait for that to change, we should be looking at strengthening our own national capacities. We should be looking at uh, building a big and powerful economy in the shortest possible time. That will also require peace on our periphery. It will require good relations with our neighborhood. It will require good engagement and samvad with the major powers of the world. And India is good at samvad. India has civilizationally proved it uh, in terms of the ability to carry on samvad uh, with uh, countries around the world. So India must work towards that objective and must use structures like the G20 uh, which have, uh, you know, uh, proved successful in this regard uh, to build a new kind of consensus. The G20 was hugely successful because of the manner in which India led it. It was an all-of-nation approach. We connected the domestic impulses with the external impulses. For the first time in history of the G20, 1.4 billion people were actually associated with this uh, huge international conclave. Um, in countries like the United States, Japan, Germany, the G20 does not arouse interest beyond the street on which it is held. But in India, it was not the case. We used it to brand India. And I think there was a lot of advantage in branding India to brand our districts, to brand our products, to brand our tourism, <coughs> cuisine, culture, to make new friends, to allow the world to see what is happening in India, to you know, build, up, build up and further improve our infrastructure and to use this opportunity to forge a new kind of consensus in an atmosphere in which people believed that it was virtually impossible. The G20 has in it the P5, it has in it the G7, it has in it the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue Partners, the BRICS, the IPSA, and all the major countries, and now with the addition of the African Union at our behest, it is actually far more representative. It is a much flatter organization and it is not given to discussing issues of, of war and peace. It is primarily meant to advance the developmental goals and objectives of humankind, especially the UN's uh, you know, agenda 2030 for sustainable development, uh, development goals. So it is the G20, I think, which uh, 
uh, as India has proved, should be taken forward. It is, it is uh, one of those frameworks where India can actually uh, play a big role in. And I am convinced that India will emerge as a great power and play a very, very major role on the world stage under the dynamic leadership that we have today uh, with or without permanent membership of the Security Council. I am convinced about that. And I want all of you to be convinced about your future. For on your shoulders rides the future of India in the 21st century. Thank you very much. We will now be inviting questions from Ambassador Chinoyan. understand your perspective on what you think is the biggest and foremost uh, security threat and challenge faced by India, a threat or challenge that it needs to prioritize and how well do you think India is addressing it? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon sir, my name is Vedant, I am a first year student in the Diplomacy and Foreign Policy Bachelor's Program. Uh, one of the fundamental characteristics of your speech was that in this globalized world, there is also a new emphasis on regionalization since India is the voice of the Global South or the Quadrilateral Summit. How, do, how does India as a nation, as a rising power, interact, with, interact in this world order where there is a reigning hegemon and a, and a rising hegemon, us as the aspiring hegemon, how do we navigate this world order uh, of globalization while also taking together regionalization and our commitments in the neighborhood? Well, there are three questions, all very profound questions. Um, I do believe that India has uh, for uh, far too long in its history uh, been um, a benign power. Um, nothing wrong with that because of the values of uh, uh, peace and non-violence and satya and ahimsa. And, and this is something that, uh, uh, you know, describes, characterizes our journey. If you look at it over the last 2,500 years, uh, from the time of Buddha to the time of Gandhi and our own, uh, you know, emancipation uh, and independence and Swaraj, uh, which was obtained without firing a shot, whereas uh, a neighboring country uh, like China did that through the muzzle of a gun, where every change came about as a revolution through bloodshed, and we saw that in other parts of the world as well. And so I would say that that is a very strong feature of Indian society, um, of, of our uh, ethos, so to speak. But at the same time, I think it's very important to develop hard power. So, you know, soft power that India has is uh, all very well. Um, and uh, it's very important to develop hard power. Um, and I'd say that there were many opportunities in India's history. Uh, to use the hard power available to our advantage to consolidate our own nation in history uh, through the centuries. But this was not possible because of uh, internal divisions. And so I think uh, uh, to, to answer your question, I think the development of hard power uh, along uh, side with uh, soft power and keeping those values in mind is of the essence and also to have a unity of purpose, to ensure that uh, uh, it is not our own people that weaken us uh, when we confront 
the outside world. We have to obviously therefore uh, make every effort to ensure that while we do not covet the territory of others, we will do what it takes uh, to uh, ensure our own sovereignty and territorial integrity. And so there should be no let up on that. Our ethos should not misguide people into thinking that India's sovereignty and territorial integrity can be uh, played around with. Um, you know, as far as uh, what is the greatest challenge uh, before our nation today, uh, some of this segues, uh, you know, into your question also. Uh, but I would say that uh, one great challenge to my mind is uh, um, rapid economic growth and development, and inclusive economic growth and development. I think this is critical because if we can ensure rapid economic growth and development, and keep it going over the next 15 to 20 years. And by all accounts, we are off to a very good start in that direction. We have uh, a very decisive and uh, resolute uh, leader. We have uh, policies in place that are now likely to give us that uh, jump uh, that we seek to higher trajectories of economic growth and development. And should we do that, it will automatically uh, help us build better sinews in terms of uh, ensuring that our interests are protected and that we are no longer a country to be trifled with. Um, so that's the first challenge, rapid economic growth and development and we are on that path already. In order to ensure that there are no uh, speed bumps along the way, we need to make sure that uh, there is peace and tranquility. Uh, and if there is a disruption of peace and tranquility, that we are up to the task in terms of meeting that challenge. But again, more foundational in my view is the need to ensure that intra-South Asian growth must take place at a higher rate. Uh, today, I would say that intra-South Asian growth is uh, merely uh, four and a half to five percent, whereas many regions of the world have shown higher uh, intra-regional trade and economic processes. And so we could learn a thing or two from Southeast Asia, East Asia, North America, even Mercosur and Latin America to see how we can ensure that uh, the region uh, grows faster. Because otherwise, uh, countries of the region uh, that either are uh, ideologically, politically, um, irrascibly against us and uh, do not join hands with India in this common search for prosperity, these can actually become drags on, on a country's rise, no matter which part of the world. So building that kind of uh, consensus in the region on the larger goals for the region, vision for the region, uh, is also something very important. Um, as for uh, uh, you know, your question about uh, you know, a world in which uh, uh, you know, there are uh, you know, reigning hegemons and, and rising hegemons and where does India find its uh, sweet spot over there? I think, uh, you know, India's sweet, sweet spot in my view lies in not uh, necessarily uh, being directly a part of uh, the binary choices that flow from uh, that description that you gave. I think India should be the, the, the third choice in many ways for the rest of the world. We need not be uh, part of the contestation between binary choices that is often upsetting for many a member of the global south. Uh, binary choices in a mutually interdependent world make for a difficult uh, decision. Uh, take for example Vietnam's case. You know. Vietnam experiences uh, China's wrath uh, and has uh, a maritime dispute uh, a history of uh, uncomfortable uh, cross-border ties, uh, yet benefits greatly from China's economic rise, even the de-risking that is taking place brings Japanese and American and European countries, by the way, even Chinese companies across to Vietnam uh, in order that you know, uh, de-risking takes place. Um, so it is loath to see a day when uh, you know there is confrontation kinetic between the United States of America and the People's Republic of China. It's a difficult choice because it has ties to the both of them. 
either economic ties or security ties or both economic and security ties. So I think India should be in a position to, on the one hand, work very closely with our strategic partners in terms of promoting, uh, you know, shared values. But remember that in these shared values, there is that T of tenets which also divides uh, like-minded partners across a historical axis. When you look at the historical axis, countries like India will have to stand up and say that uh, Western countries that have a colonial past may today also have values that we don't entirely share. And uh, we will therefore have to reset those for them as well so that they realize that uh, India of today is different from the India that was once a colony like many countries of the global south. So we have to work with uh, our uh, partners, we have to help them understand uh, the India of today. But um, we must also offer a third choice because the world is yearning for that third choice. A, a choice which is free of the insinuations of uh, expediency or territorial gain or uh, uh, scrimmage or a rush towards uh, uh, you, you know uh, taking away your natural resources uh, we we india is fully capable of offering that third choice we have time for one more round I have no mic, but I'll just say other question anyways. So considering that equitable globalization was one of the main themes of your address, what would you say are the changes ne needed at the, at the institutional level in international organizations such as the United Nations or the IMF? For example, you already mentioned the African Union being in the G20. That's a positive step towards a more equitable form of growth. Ask <laughs> yeah, for doubling your excellency and thank you for an enlightening speech. So my question is regarding to the world at large. So we see that nations are defining on certain nationalist terms uh, through defense. So um, this brings us back to the, to the history where we've seen how um, the concepts of self-determination that the UN has propounded, in which nations are allowed to determine themselves and uh, draw boundaries on their own wishes. So do you think that this sort of an ambiguous term requires sort of redefinition that uh, do you think that self-determination is a new definition right now for uh, the you know securing of this global village? Global village. Yeah. Thank you, Ambassador, for your uh, lecture. So uh, you had mentioned the Indian Ocean River Association and somebody who has worked uh, on the Western Indian Ocean and national security. Considering that a majority of the international internationalized structures that have been built in the Western Indian Ocean by India or other countries are failing, how do you believe that India will take a forward step in the Western Indian Ocean, especially con considering the fact that there are a large amount of piracy sessions and anti-piracy operations that are you know, being conducted? Thank you. Thank you. Um, all very erudite and interesting questions shows the uh, depth of knowledge that you acquired from your gurus who are seated here. Uh, please always remember to respect your parents and your gurus. You will go far. Okay. Now, and your mothers especially, they are the first teachers. Um, your question, you know, about uh, what kind of reforms are required. I actually mentioned in terms of resetting globalization, I expressed my own dismay and disappointment and my lack of uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, very deep optimism about changes taking any place, any time soon in the UN Security Council. But we must keep working on that. But when it comes to the multilateral development banks and the international financial institutions, I think we must give it uh, uh, a real heave hope and we must uh, continue to push the envelope there. We have seen that some of the inequities that are built in the UN Security Council are also reflected in the uh, unequal systems that prevail in the uh, you know, uh, multilateral development bank uh, banks and the international financial institutions. Take for example the IMF. In the IMF uh, you have one trillion dollars roughly worth of finance available of which uh, about four hundred and fifty uh, billion dollars 
is directly in the hands of, again, the uh, developed Western powers, the traditional uh, engines of economic growth, the traditional economic powers. The rest of it is also indirectly in their hands through what you call bilateral borrowing uh, arrangements or new arrangements to borrow uh, and the terminology that's used there. Uh, so indirectly or, or directly, the entire trillion dollars is controlled when you look at uh, controlled by these uh, developing de developed countries, beg your pardon. We have also seen how these special drawing rights have not been, uh, uh, you know, uh, amended fundamentally. If an Indian economy today is the size that it is today, uh, contributing to uh, the global GDP uh, uh, at an even higher rate, um, and, and certainly more uh, than the uh, UK uh, GDP, uh, why is it that the uh, you know SDR uh, available to India is uh, around 3.7 percent, uh, whereas uh, the SDR a share available to the United Kingdom is around 4.25 percent. And why is it that one country uh, has 17.5 percent uh, of the share, that's the United States of America? And when you look at the the consensus majority required for change, uh, it's uh, 80 percent uh, of of uh, uh, you know the member states. And so if you have uh, uh, a, a country like uh, the United States of America uh, accounting for 17.5%, you know that the veto power there also lies in a few hands. So it is time that we change these structures also and make sure that uh, there is equality, that there is uh, enough say there uh, in decision making uh, for representatives of the global south. Um, you know, you spoke about uh, the uh, issue of self-determination in different parts of the world and expression. Uh, personally, I think today self-determination needs to be seen in a different light. This globalized world, and I call it a globalized world because globalization is like a, a genie. It cannot be put back into the bottle. It's like uh, nuclear weapons technology. It cannot be unlearned. It will be there somewhere in either a legal or an illegal form, ready to be fungible. Uh, so for me, the greater challenge today is the role of uh, uh, NGOs and uh, civil society, um, including uh, youth across the world that do not live by the common definition of nationality. I think that is one of the greatest disruptive challenges to uh, either nationalism or self-determination. Because in this interconnected world of ours, uh, NGOs, civil society, uh, big business, big tech and the youth are connecting in ways that are counterintuitive to the interpretation of uh, nationality or national interests. And that, I think, uh, uh, makes for a very difficult interpretation of self-determination because there are new constituencies uh, that describe self-determination among themselves straddling uh, boundaries and flags and nationalities. So I think we have to give some thought to that. I am personally worried about that because it can make for a chaotic world at the end of the day. After all, you know, interstate relations, international relations are conducted normally by state entities or quasi-state entities, particularly after they have acquired some kind of political power uh, or some kind of territory. Even ISIS uh, at a certain point of time became a quasi-state when it acquired territory. Or uh, the Taliban having come back to Afghanistan is once again a state entity. Or Hamas after they took over uh, Gaza uh, and, and, and Trump, the uh, you know, Palestinian National Authority uh, and, and other groups became a, a quasi-state entity at least in one part of their territory. So they have to conduct the business of international relations at the end of the day. The dialogue and discourse for peace and security is done by them. It's not done by these uh, 
um, rather uh, in um, you know inchoate groups uh, that straddle uh, our national boundaries. As far as the Indian Ocean is concerned, and particularly the Western Indian Ocean, um, you know it's a very complex uh, geography. Uh, traditionally so because uh, uh, this is a geography in which uh, uh, what we call resident littoral powers like India have long been major naval powers. The very word in Sanskrit uh, Navgat gave rise to the word navigation and we know that there are ancient links between India's uh, west coast and uh, uh, you know Mesopotamia and Egypt uh, the uh, countries of West Asia and the Gulf, many of which uh, till the 1940s even used the rupee as their uh, currency. Um, the coast of uh, Zanj on the east coast of Africa, again a long history. The same coast that connected Vasco da Gama when he sailed around the Cape of uh, Good Hope and was then steered across to the west coast of India. The fair monsoon winds that connected these two sides. So, we have a great stake in what happens in the Western Indian Ocean, but it is also an ocean in which the great colonial powers have long been around as stakeholders. Once the, uh, you know, uh, the Portuguese uh, and the Dutch came in, uh, the British and the French uh, uh, were also not far behind. Uh, and we have seen, particularly after the opening of the Suez, how integral uh, these choke points have become with the larger water bodies uh, of the Western Indian Ocean, whether the Strait of Hormuz or whether uh, you know uh, the Red Sea, they all connect to this part of the world. This is also a world in which there is an arc of instability uh, with, with terrorism, narco-terrorism in the Pakistan, Afghanistan areas, to radicalization, to the uh, you know rise of. Uh, uh, you know, ideologically, uh, you know, incorrigible groups uh, uh, which are not at peace with humankind, like ISIS, and then the uh, you know branches of the Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and Al Shabaab in in Africa, the Horn of Africa is besought with problems today. You can see that the the entire Red Sea is besought with problems. At the deep end, you have Egypt, which is mired obviously indirectly in the West Asian conflagration. And then you have uh, uh, the issues in Sudan, which, which continue uh, to bedevil them. In um, the case of Ethiopia and Eritrea, there are ongoing issues. Ethiopia also had problems in Tigray. Ethiopia now has problems with, with Somalia because of the uh, you know, uh, port that uh, uh, has been uh, created in, uh, in Somaliland uh, for the Ethiopians. So, uh, and the Houthis are uh, obviously sitting atop all this chaos and pointing their missiles and guns and their drones. Uh, the Samad drone, for example, is a, a very potent uh, uh, drone. Uh, I, I didn't realize these drones operate at 1100 kilometers and 1500, 100 kilometers away. So the kind of long range uh, you know, that they have, the kind of missiles that they have created there, uh, these are extraordinary uh, in terms of their reach. And so we have to do what it takes. You are aware, and I'll conclude on this uh, rather detailed uh, intervention, that you know India has also valued its strategic autonomy in this part of the world in which there are resident powers. The United States of America is resident in Diego Garcia. The UK is resident in Diego Garcia. France is resident in Mayotte. France is resident in uh, Reunion. Uh, and uh, uh, the Russians, uh, and the Chinese are coming and exercising with the Iranians and the South Africans there. And just about everybody is present because the high seas belong to, uh, you know, to everyone. Uh, but there is a lot of illegal fishing in the Central Indian Ocean, particularly of squid, which is not subject to the Inter you know, Indian Ocean Tuna Commission's uh, directives, nor is it part of the allocations or permits given by the Southern Indian Ocean Fisheries Agreement and so on and so forth, and, and you know which particular country sends its uh, fishing uh, fleets um, uh, with, with transponders and AIS switched off. So for us that's a, that's a huge and complex issue, but we have sought strategic autonomy there. We have now, after a, a fairly long period of being on our own there as an independent navy, 
finally become an associate partner with the uh, combined uh, maritime uh, forces there uh, and particularly to cooperate uh, in regard to uh, uh, you know, maritime security and anti-piracy operations with combined task force uh, 151 uh, because there are a number of task forces there each with a different function uh, CTF 150, 151, 152, 153 and uh, each of which does a different function. 153, for example, is Maritime Security of the Horn of Africa. 154 is the Training Command. Uh, and 151 and 152 look at uh, uh, Maritime Security and Piracy in the Arabian Sea. Um, and um, uh, you are aware that uh, um, the 152 uh, looks at uh, security in the Gulf of Hormuz. 150 and 151 in the Arabian Sea. So it's it's a complex situation. We were earlier part of the shape mechanism, shared awareness and deconfliction, which uh, looked at uh, issues to do with piracy. Piracy had abated between 2008 and 2016. We saw it rising and then subsiding with the focus shifting to the Gulf of Guinea, where again we are cooperating with the EU and other uh, navies. Uh, um, so I think India must look to working with like-minded partners. This is an opportunity for India also to establish, re-establish itself as uh, a major navy uh, in waters that are closest to us. And um, ultimately, I'd say if you're looking at our security in Mandala terms, then this is our f uh, first Mandala, uh, the Indian Ocean, both the Western Indian Ocean and the Eastern Indian Ocean. For me, the South China Sea is a second Mandala, and the Pacific is a third mandala. Not that they are not important, but the first mandala is, is very important, even if you go by Chanakya. Thank you.